Alrighty, you guys want me to start or start? Okay. Alrighty, thank you so much, Dr. Ways, for your lecture. From the heights of ARDS, exciting, uh, you know, data. We're gonna go down to the depths of phenotypes and endotypes of asthma and biologic therapy. Um, just to start, um, I have no disclosures. Nobody pays me to say any of this. Um, but basically, the crux of this uh, presentation is to make you understand that asthma as we know it, um, and what we've been practicing as internists, at least before we did the fellowship, is no longer thought of as a single entity. And we used to think of it as, oh, asthma, we treat it the same way, uh, but it is considered to be an obsolete um, uh, uh, entity now. It's usually a, basically a, a bunch of different uh, clinical conditions, very heterogeneous, uh, in their response to therapies, but they're all under the umbrella of asthma. Asthma itself, of course, we all know is typical symptoms. You have your wheezing, chest pain, you obviously have some kind of reversible airway obstruction. Um, but even though they present in the same way and pathophysiologically, they may appear the same. They have uh, bronchial wall thickening, they have increased mucus production. I mentioned the reversible airway obstruction. Uh, they are unique. Uh, the different phenotypes and endotypes are very unique in their natural history, the way they present and in their severity. And most importantly for us as clinicians in the way they respond to treatment. Um, so to kind of have you understand how we came up with the phenotypes and endotypes we have now, I just wanted to do a quick quick brief overview of like the history of asthma. Won't be too many details, more pictures than anything else. But basically the first descriptions of asthma came from a uh, you know, long time ago uh, from the Hippocratic corpus. And at that time they were, even at that time they recognized the association of asthma with environmental factors, uh, certain winds, geographical areas. There was something they, they noticed that there were some triggers uh, to set off that, that set of symptoms. Uh, after that, there's a great timeline here on this picture where in um, uh, 1698, that was the first time they described a formal description of asthma as wheezing, and they identified associations of asthma with specific regions and triggers. Uh, in the beginning of the uh, uh, late 19th century, they had a more formalized definition of asthma. And then after that, in 1947, that's when they actually introduced the criteria of FEV1 uh, as a diagnostic criteria for asthma. And then the first uh, two endotypes that were ever in, uh, first introduced into practice were by Rackman in 1947 as well, where they described extrinsic and intrinsic asthma. And this is important. Uh, I'll talk about this in a later slide, but this is kind of where we are understanding, at least as internists, kind of end where we think, oh, it's extrinsic or intrinsic asthma. And we don't really think about that beyond that. In the 1950s, uh, McCombs described the use of systemic corticosteroids to treat asthma for the first time. And it's very interesting. I, I put a slide of his study, a uh, very rudimentary kind of uh, uh, picture here. But what you can see is the smooth lines um, uh, are the severity of the asthma symptoms and the blocked uh, uh, squares you see are the dosages of steroids that he used. And you can see that there's an association where wherever steroids were implemented, there's an improvement in those asthma symptoms. Um, so that was the first time that that response was described. And then in 1970s, they moved from oral to, uh, from topical corticosteroids to inhaled corticosteroids as a standard of care. And then following this is kind of where we now, I want to elaborate a bit more, uh, is that's where our understanding of phenotypes and endotypes came in following all of this. So just to begin first, we need to understand what am, what am I talking about? What is a phenotype itself? So a phenotype in a patient is, are these common characteristics which you can identify uh, and they're grouped together to try to help you understand which therapies that patient will respond to. Um, and what is an endotype? It is somewhat related, but basically it is the basis, it is the molecular mechanism by which you develop that phenotype. So those are your basic definitions. Um, and we'll go through first the evolution of those phenotypes. So I mentioned back in 1940, that's when Rackman described the first uh, two phenotypes, extrinsic and intrinsic. And just so to refresh your memory, I'm sure you know about this, but 
Extrinsic asthma is where it was due, it was believed to be due to allergens outside the body associated with environmental exposures, atopy, allergic diseases. Those are all grouped together in that extrinsic form of asthma. Whereas intrinsic was thought to be not related to those things. It was, it was thought to be due to factors within the body. Uh, and those patients usually lacked atopy and they were usually noted to be at an older age of onset. And that's basically most majority of our, I would say primary care understanding of asthma kind of ends where we see allergic, non-allergic, that's the, the basic understanding. But there's, believe me, there's a bunch more. So that's kind of our first block there. We, we started understanding extrinsic versus intrinsic asthma. In the 1960s, then we had, you know, the classic Sampter's triad. That's when it was reported asthma, nasal polyposis, aspirin sensitivity. Uh, and this was identified as a later onset asthma. It was also associated with eosinophilia. So that was our second different phenotype we started to identify. It was later uh, recharacterized and known as aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. And then following that, um, this was in the 1950s, the first time they started to identify the association of sputum eosinophils and, their, um, uh, and then predicting response to corticosteroid therapy. Um, uh, um, so they started to uh, uh, notice that the presence of sputum is eosinophilia those patients tended uh, to respond better to corticosteroids versus those who did not have that. So then we had this, uh, uh, another phenotype developed. So, so far we have kind of, we're starting to branch out in our understanding of asthma to build on that uh, finding of corticosteroids affecting certain patients versus others. There were several trials of, of those. I want to show you two of them. This is a great study. This is where they targeted uh, patients and they divided them into two groups. One of them was to just treat them as standard British Thoracic Society guidelines, very similar to our GINA guidelines. What they did was they, um, they did stepwise therapy. If asthma severity was, uh, severity was high, they stepped up therapy to try to control them with a uh, long-acting beta agonist and heal corticosteroids and so forth. The second group was actually very interesting where they actually targeted uh, sputum eosinophilia to keep it under 3%. And you can see already there that when they targeted the sp sp uh, to keep the sputum eosinophilia less than 3%, there's already a difference in the degree of severe exacerbations those patients had. So that added more credence to this, this uh, the, the uh, more proof to the fact that sputum eosinophilia is somewhat of a basis, a molecular basis for that uh, phenotype that responds well to corticosteroids. This was another study, very similar in nature. Basically, the two lines I want you to focus on is the solid gray line up top and the black line on, at the bottom. The, those are basically your non-eosinophilic and your persistent eosinophilic patients. And basically, they received a 10 to 14-day course, oral steroids, inhaled corticosteroids, and a leukotriene modif uh, modifier. And they looked at their pre-bronchodilator FEV1. And you can see that in that 14-day period, which is the halfway mark in the graph, you can already see that there's an improvement in that pre-bronchodilator FEV1 in the eosinophilic group, but there's no change whatsoever in the non-eosinophilic group. After that, they also checked the uh, uh, post-bronchodilator FEV1 changes. And you can see that both of them do have an improvement after, post, uh, after a bronchodilator is administered, which makes you still believe that they still were asthmatic. They had a reversible airway obstruction, but you can clearly see that difference in the response to that immunomodulatory um, therapy. Um, so that's kind of where we then started to branch into, okay, there's two forms of asthma. We know there's an eosinophilic component and there's a non-eosinophilic component. Um, so far, so good, right? It's pretty simple. Eosinophils are bad. Non-eosinophils may be, may be good, maybe not. But here's where it gets tricky, okay? I'm going to try to guide you through <laughs> the next few uh, phenotypes that they, where they thought about. So when they looked at the patients who uh, they now identified clearly having eosinophilic asthma and non-eosinophilic asthma, the, the one thing they wanted to make sure was, are there other factors besides that on a phenotypic level? So if you're looking at a patient in the clinic, does their age matter? Does the fact that they have atopic symptoms matter? Uh, those kind of things. Did they also play a factor into this? And they, so they did a study where they actually divided patients into uh, four groups somewhat. Two groups first were age, uh, if they had asthma onset before age of 12 years and after age of 12 years. And then they also subdivided those into the presence and absence of lung use in a um, this was a study with 80 patients. Um, they, uh, the way they characterized the lung eosinophils was if they had an eosinophil cell count that was two times the standard deviation, they were put in the eosinophil group versus non-eosinophil group. Um, so the, just to kind of summarize the findings in those, if you had your early onset patients and your late onset patients, the patients with late onset asthma tended to have more subjects with elevated eosinophils. Um, the patients with early onset asthma had more allergen skin testing positivity and more atopic symptoms. And you can see this is a graph that kind of just basically highlights what I just said is where 
they were asked on a questionnaire in response to these different triggers, did they have more allergic symptoms? And the early group uh, throughout all of those different things uh, had way more atopic symptoms, more allergic skin positivity in 98% of those patients versus about 60 to 70% of the patients who were in the late onset. Um, clinically, however, did this matter? They actually asked them, uh, Does you, are your symptoms different? And there was actually no difference in reported symptoms. So they dug a bit deeper. And they, as I mentioned earlier, they separated those two groups further into eosinophil positive and negative groups. And just to summarize that, what they saw was in uh, the eosinophil positive groups, in both early and late onset, eosinophilia is associated with greater symptom severity. So you can see cough, wheeze, chest tightness, shortness of breath, everything in the early and late onset is worse in patients who had higher eosinophilia. And then in early, the early onset group specifically, the high um, eosinophil group had a higher rate of intubation and also had a lower FEV1 and FVC. When we come to uh, the molecular basis of these patients, in the early onset group, they had a uh, increased numbers of mast cells, increased numbers of CD3 cells. And this was a point in a direction of a type two type of inflammation, which we'll get into in a bit. But it started to give us a bit more idea of what was going on on a molecular level. So they said, uh, there's more of this, these type of inflammatory cells in the patients who are using a full positive. Um, the other things they saw were there was increased uh, TGF beta cells. These are cells that are associated with a bit more uh, of um, uh, 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 affecting the um, uh, basement membrane thickness. And in late asthma, there was increased uh, basement membrane thickness. So without confusing you a bit further, just to summarize, uh, in your early and late onset asthma groups, there are distinct differences. You can see that there's more atopic, more allergic in the early onset group. In the late onset, not so much, but there is a lot of overlap. Um, Eosinophilia in general, when, you, when you, they saw patients with that, they had a higher degree of symptoms. They had worse lung function, both by FEV1 and FPC, and higher grade of intubation. And then eosinophilia in that early onset group started to point toward the molecular mechanism, which we'll talk about in a bit, uh, the so-called type 2 inflammation. And then in the late onset group, where they saw this increased uh, basement membrane thickness and the non eosinophilic uh, uh, phenotype, they, 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 they thought this was completely something different on its own. It was a different pathological process. And it may explain why these patients were more resistant to steroids. So uh, what they started to see was this branch then became not just xenophilic and non xenophilic they also had to categorize it as, is it early? Is it late? Is it allergic? Is it non-allergic? Because that also had clinical implications. Uh, they did another study, which was very similar. The only difference here that I'll point out is that they also evaluated with an endobronchial biopsy. Uh, allergy testing clinical history was about the same. They used the same cutoffs, the two standard deviations to put patients in the xenophil group and the negative group. And long story short was they found the same finding, the xenophilia with higher intubation, worse lung function. But the reason why I included this study was this was a study that first started to recognize the presence of neutrophil counts in the patients who had severe asthma and who weren't responding very well to traditional therapy, they started to see that those patients had higher neutrophil counts. So then that adds a third factor to this, which is, are, is it neutrophilic inflammation versus non-neutrophilic inflammation? So no, I told you it was going to get tricky. So, but that's basically, uh, that's the understanding up to this point, okay? So then they said, okay, enough of all this, we're doing all these studies, we're starting to, we're starting to see a pattern, and let's try to put this all together into uh, a large cluster analysis, which they termed the Severe Asthma Research Program. There's another UK um, uh, parallel to this as well, which also found the same things. And basically what it was, was they took 726 patients. These were uh, all subjects above the age of 12 years. And they took uh, uh, all this um, uh, information from them to try to put them in these phenotypic groups. What they got was medication use, their healthcare utilization, their pulmonary function testing, their response to beta adrenergic agonists. And then they also had evaluations for ATP, their serum uh, IgE levels and then also some specimen levels, blood, sputum, and in some cases, they also did a, a bronchoscopy as well. And basically, when they tried to fact put these into nice, neat, different clusters, this is what they came up with. Um, just to kind of simplify this, cluster one, two, and four are your allergic asthma patients. They're your patients who have atopic symptoms, they have a uh, high degree of reversible, uh, uh, they have varying degree of reversibility of their airway obstruction. That's why they're put into the mild allergic asthma, the mid to moderate allergic asthma, and then cluster four is your severe allergic asthma. But all of them had very high atopic symptoms 
uh, uh, which kind of pointed towards that um, being the pathophysiological basis. The other clusters are a bit more confusing, but what they are is cluster three is generally, if you were to think about it, a patient higher, uh, older age, number one, and high BMI, obese patients. They're less atopic. Uh, and then cluster five is actually very interesting. It's something that we always kind of throw around in the when we're talking about these patients, but it's patients actually who have a fixed airflow obstruction, very similar to COPD. So they're, uh, they're, they're the patients that you kind of talk about in the COPD overlap type of a situation. So those are your five clusters that they came up with in the SAR program. And to better categorize that into an easier way to look at it, you can see that this graph kind of puts them into two groups. There's the early onset, late onset group. And in the early onset group, you have that varying degree of severity from mild to moderate to severe. And you can see that generally in your allergic asthmatic patients, they're more uh, towards the younger age of onset, whereas your COPD-like asthma and the cluster three obese asthma, that's more in your late, uh, uh, um, uh, they have a late onset of asthma. Uh, but you're starting to see these distinct phenotypes start to develop based on these uh, cluster analyses. So how does this matter for us, right? So we have all these clusters, everything's great, we have good graphs, but how, do, how can we sort our patients into these clusters and how, um, and if you see a patient in a clinic, for example. So they actually, the SARP analysis came up with a great uh, little flow chart for you. The way that they sorted these patients out into the clusters, they used this graph and they actually had an 80% accuracy of putting them into the right cluster. The way they did it was they looked at their baseline FEV1, if it's more or less than 68%. And then they looked at after the bronchodilator, what their FEV1 looked like. So for example, if you just follow uh, cluster one, you have a high FEV1 to begin with. You have great reversibility with the bronchodilator and that just puts you in the mild allergic uh, cluster one. Uh, versus for example, the fixed uh, airflow obstruction in the cluster five group, you have a very low FEV1 to begin with and you don't really have a great, uh, uh, airway, air, airway uh, obstruction reversibility, even after the bronchodilator is administered, their FEV1 stays less than 65, and that ends up in cluster five. And they, so on and so forth, they were able to do it with an 80% accuracy, put them into these five different phenotypic clusters. I will say though, that there's caveats to that. So there is some overlap, especially the group that had the most overlap using this classification was cluster three, which is your obese, high BMI asthma. That usually um, was mischaracterized uh, as either cluster two or cluster four. So there are um, obviously limitations for using that flowchart, but it is somewhat um, useful in at least categorizing the allergic groups and the non-allergic groups with fixed airflow obstruction. The other limitations I wanna bring up for that clinical phenotyping is that you could put them in these nice categories. You can understand somewhat of the basis of their, uh, uh, their presentation, but it's still difficult to uh, predict their response to asthma therapies. One great example I wanna give you is the use of uh, omalizumab. So we always think omalizumab, it's uh, IgE, uh, it works on IgE, it's gonna work great for allergic asthma, but that doesn't always work out. You can see here, at least in the bottom graph, where it uh, categorizes discontinuation of corticosteroids in these patients, and there's not really a linear association with the dosing of omalizumab. You can see that, yes, there is a, a higher discontinuation in the low dose omalizumab, but when you get to the high dose, it really kind of tapers off and there's not a, it's a heterogeneous response. And when they did a post hoc analysis, they actually saw that there's different factors. One of them was uh, how much inhaled corticosteroid are you using? The ones that were using more inhaled corticosteroid, they responded well to malizumab. The other thing was uh, the baseline FEV1. If you had a worse baseline FEV1, you responded better to malizumab. Uh, and there were other factors. One of them was also if you were in the emergency department in the past year. So there's very big limitations to clinical phenotyping where you can see that you could put, you can understand that they're allergic asthma, but they may have a heterogeneous response, okay? So that brings us to our next part of this, which is then, is it better to then understand the underlying molecular uh, factors that lead to these phenotypes? And that's basically endotyping. So your molecular physiological phenotyping. Um, to understand that just very briefly, this is a slide that I wanna focus on a two or three things. One of them is your type two uh, T helper cells and this uh, production of IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. And basically, they lead to all the pathophysiological processes that we know in asthma, which is the xenophil uh, migration and survival, the degranulation of mast cells, and so on and so forth. Um, so initially, what they understood, they thought that these three cytokines are only secreted by your type 2 CD4 cells. Uh, but then they realized that, no, they're actually produced by basophils, mast cells, xenophils. So then the, the terminology changed from TH2 asthma to type 2 high asthma. And that's kind of what we'll refer to this uh, going forward. 
So then again, just to harken back to the previous slide, remember this was what they started to see signs of in those early phenotyping studies. They started to see that inflammation with more xenophils, more mast cells in that early onset group, in the xenophil positive group, they started to see that uh, pathway appear. So um, then they started to say, okay, how can we then divide patients with asthma, severe asthma in this case, into these two night, uh, these uh, two um, endotypes, the type two high asthma and the type two low asthma. So they looked at IL-13 specifically and which genes is expressed. And you don't obviously have to know the names of these, but these were the three genes that it expressed uh, in those patients. And then they took a series of patients uh, with uh, severe asthma and they divided them into based on the gene expression of, of, um, of those th three genes. And they divided them into these two very neat groups, those with high expression and those with low expression. Uh, and they characterize them as that's type two high in the red and type two low asthma in the blue. And they also had some controls mixed in. And why does this matter? A couple of things I'll show you in the next uh, slides. You see that in the red bars, that's your type two high asthma. Those are the patients that are producing very large amounts of the cytokines that we mentioned, IL-13, IL-5, IL-4. Uh, and then you, the blue bars are your controls and the gray ones are your type two low asthma. So the controls and the type two low asthma actually didn't differ at all in those production of those cytokines, but the type two high asthma has very high levels of those cytokines. Why does this matter? The biggest thing here is that when they compared them side to side, um, there was Im improved in airway hyper-responsiveness in patients with type two high asthma. This is in response to methacholine challenge. So it's important that these patients, if you see a type two high asthmatic, you will know they'll have improved airway hyper-responsiveness. The other thing that you will also see is that they'll have higher amounts of serum IgE, blood and airway xenophilia, which is something that also harkens back to the earlier studies we discussed. And then finally, um, uh, also you also see increased mucin gene expression, subepithelial fibrosis. But then the most important fact here that I wanted to point out was that finally they did all this, they did the gene expression, they saw the type two high asthmatics and the non-type two high asthmatics, and then they exposed them to corticosteroids. And you can see that the response is actually only isolated to your type two high asthmatics. The patients who are expressing those genes associated with IL-13, those are the only patients who responded to corticosteroids, whereas if you look at the type two low asthmatics, they didn't have that response. So it's, it was very important clinically to then uh, divide them into those two groups. So basically um, our pathway, which we constructed slowly looking at the evolution of asthma over about 50 or 60 years, that becomes uh, this. And um, the thing here I wanna just express is that it's, I think this is an important slide uh, mainly because it's gonna become the basis of your understanding of asthma in the coming years. It may not be in practice right now, but if you can at least understand that there's these two big molecular processes going on, one is type two high, type two low asthma, and then there are subtypes in, in those two groups. Uh, namely, for example, in the type two high asthmatics, we have all the allergic asthmatics, we have exercise induced as asthma, and then we have asthma and exacerbated respiratory disease, all of which we've gone through in the previous slides. Those are the ones that we are most well understood. And, uh, some of the ones that we see in the clinic that respond very well to our established therapy. But there's also a subset that doesn't respond well to therapy, and that's usually your non-type 2 asthmatics. Those are the ones associated with obesity, uh, so associated with smoking, neutrophilic, uh, um, and uh, postgranulocytic asthma. Those are the patients that usually you'll be putting on endless amounts of steroids. They'll be coming to the ED every few months and not responding to that therapy. So at least if you can take away from this slide that there's two big subsets, one that we understand very well and our therapy does work somewhat very well in them. And then there's a subset that doesn't respond very well. That's I think a big takeaway here. And moving forward, uh, when we get better, um, uh, uh, better understanding of the biomarkers associated with these two molecular processes, you'll be able to subcategorize your patients more into these different uh, categories. Speaking about the biomarkers very quickly, uh, I know a lot of the studies use sputum as xenophils, but uh, pragmatically speaking, when you're in the clinic, it, you know, this is not something that every institution is able to do, which is to measure sputum as you know, xenophilia. So blood as xenophils are usually the ones that have been used in at least all the trials for the biological therapies, which we'll go through. Uh, and I will at least give you a caveat that the blood eosinophils don't necessarily correlate very well with sputum eosinophilia. Uh, but sputum eosinophilia usually correlates very well with blood eosinophilia. Uh, but I think the reason why, at least in my mind, why they use blood eosinophils in the biologic therapy studies is that it's just way more practical. Like if you have a patient in clinic to get a CBC and a diff is probably the easiest thing in the world. And uh, we'll go through uh, how that actually did help uh, us identify patients who would benefit or not benefit from biologic therapy. 
The other thing that I, I feel in the coming years will be something that we will start to use way more is something called a fractional exhaled nitric oxide. Basically what this is, is that your uh, nitric oxide synthase is something that's upregulated by the, the cytokines we talked about, IL-13 and IL-4. And so you, you see a higher amount of fractional ex exhaled nitric oxide in patients who have that type two type of asthma. Uh, I, right now, it's not recommended that uh, pheno, be, a pheno be used as, a, as usually a, as an endotyping marker or phenotyping marker, but I, I feel in the coming years, um, this will be something that you guys will be more familiar with. So having said all that, I just wanted to give you that history of how we got to this point where we now understand asthma as at least these six or seven different groups, two different nice endotypes, and then the groups between them. But then how does this all apply to our patients in our clinic, right? So you have someone who comes in, nothing is working, and you have to, number one, identify them as having severe or uncontrolled or both asthma, right? So the definition, just very quickly, is that usually when you're talking about severe asthma, you're already at your GINA steps four and five. You're already on kind of the, the your end of your tether in terms of management. You're under high-dose inhaled corticosteroid. You're a long-acting beta agonist or leukotriene modifier. Uh, and for the previous year, either they've been on systemic corticosteroids for more than 50% of that year to prevent it from being uncontrolled, or it remains uncontrolled despite doing all of those different things. So number one, you have to identify that patient who's severe. You, you, you're on steroids, you're on the good controlling medication, but still nothing is working. And just to give you an example of how you would define not working uh, is um, uh, uncontrolled asthma is defined as having an ACQ score above 1.5 an ACT score less than 20, and I'll show you the, the quick questionnaires for that. Uh, or very simply, if they have severe exacerbations uh, more than three days each in the previous year requiring systemic corticosteroids, if they have one hospitalization or an ICU stay or mechanical ventilation, or they have an uh, airflow limitation with a um, uh, FEV1 less than 80% predicted um, uh, after bronchodilator therapy, those are kind of those patients where you would define them as uncontrolled asthma despite the therapies that you've given them. Uh, just very quickly, the two things, we do use these in our clinic, um, uh, not so much, I think, the ACQ, I think we use more the ACT, but generally speaking, uh, the ACQ is a questionnaire where they use these seven questions and they take an average from that, so they're all scored from zero to six, and then they take an average, and if it's more than 1.5, it's uncontrolled. The same uh, with the ACT is the, the better controlled uh, you are, the, the um, higher score you would have, but the less controlled you are, the lower score you'll have. So a, an ACT less than 20 is considered uncontrolled. Um, so now you've identified your patient, you know they have severe asthma, you know they have uncontrolled asthma. Uh, the, what next steps can you take? So one, you wanna make sure that they do have a legit diagnosis of, a diagnosis of asthma. Sometimes we get patients sent to the clinic all the time with this label, but it's not necessarily very accurate because you wanna make sure that they have that bronchodilator uh, testing and that they demonstrate airway uh, obstructive uh, reversibility. And then you wanna work through your very quickly, your alternate diagnosis. You wanna think about COPD, sarcoidosis, you wanna think about um, a bronchiectasis, uh, ILD, cardiovascular disease, anything that would confound the image and make you think that your asthma is uncontrolled. Um, the second, the other part to that is you may have asthma, but you have things that are associated with asthma that make it way more severe. One could be ABPA, eGPA, uh, aspirin sensitivity, and then exercise infused bronchospasm. Those are all things that make a relatively well-controlled patient in other circumstances way worse. You want to identify those things as well, and there's appropriate workup for that, of course. Uh, then you want to do a trial of trigger avoidance. If they tell you there's cold air, exercise, you know, dust, such and such things make things worse, of course, you want to trial for trigger avoidance. And then you want to evaluate your medication regimen. So are you on the appropriate GINA um, steps for that patient's severity and their symptom uh, 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 frequency? You want to make sure that you're optimizing that as best as you can. And then finally, we come to that point where you're referring back to what did Daniel say in that lecture? Uh, nothing's working. I need to phenotype this patient. So our understanding thus far of phenotyping is that you would at least go towards getting at least a serum IgE and an absolute xenophil count. Those are at least the two markers for now that are recommended to phenotype patients. And the reason for that I'll describe in the coming slides is because those two uh, have mostly been used as markers for our uh, trials for the biologic therapies. So before we get into the biologic therapies, just very quickly, again, just reminding you, IL-4, IL-13, IL-5, those are your main targets for biologic therapies. And they obviously result in all of these different things, including mast cell degranulation, your basement membrane thickening, your go goblet cell hyperplasia, the xenophil activation, the bone marrow, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's get into a couple of cases. 
So case one, you have a lady who's 25 years old. She tells you she has childhood asthma. So for the last 20 years, she has asthma. She went to the ED twice in the past year. She required oral steroids. So this is what type of asthma? Is this well control? Is this a mild asthma, moderate asthma? It's severe asthma, right? And then um, the, she's having all of these symptoms despite being on a high dose inhaled corticosteroid and a LABA and a leukotriene modifier. So is this well-controlled asthma? It's uncontrolled asthma, right? So we've gone through that part. They do skin testing. It's positive for um, a bunch of different things. The IgE level is 436. So without knowing uh, kind of the next few slides, what would you recommend? <laughs> Was Dalamav? <laughs> Infliximab, tocilizumab, which one? Omalizumab? That's absolutely right. So Shraddha, you win the prize for today. <laughs> but um, so omalizumab, basically, as we were probably the most familiar with omalizumab, uh, it's a monoclonal Ig uh, antibody that binds to IgE. IgE, of course, uh, the problem with that is in the at least its its role in the pathophysiology of asthma. It binds to the mast cells and basophils and causes degranulation, and then you have inflammatory mediators, and that presents physically as an asthma attack. So omalizumab is that anti-IG antibody binds to the Ig molecule, prevents it from binding to the receptors, and then prevents that degranulation and the asthma attack. So uh, we know it works in uh, theory, but then what is its efficacy in reality? And actually, it's pretty good um, when patients with moderate to severe allergic asthma, so the patients who have uh, Ig levels uh, that I'll mention in a bit, it reduced exacerbations by 25%. It reduces hospitalizations um, uh, and it reduces, uh, allows a reduction in inhaled corticosteroid dosing as well. Um, you can see here that when your patients with inhaled corticosteroid use, uh, there's a uh, reduction on compared to placebo, 75 versus 50%. And then also in your patient's uh, main asthma symptom scores and the number of rescue puffs they use for albuterol every day, there was a significant difference in those two groups between the placebo and omalizumab groups. Um, so, of course, we know it has a good efficacy. There is uh, one part of this uh, where I wanted to uh, just emphasize some nuances to that. One of the fact, one of the things that I mentioned earlier was that, remember that it, um, at least when you're looking at them from a phenotypic standpoint, even if you identify someone as having allergic asthma, remember there were limitations to that. There was a heterogeneous response we talked about in the earlier slides. And then even on an endotypic level, there's also nuances to response. Uh, where you have, when they looked at a post hoc analysis of that study, the patients who had more nitric oxide exhale fraction, those patients responded much better to omalizumab. The patients who had more xenophils, they responded much better to omalizumab. And then uh, the last group is the patients who had expressed the, the gene that's associated with IL-13, those patients responded way better to omalizumab. So there's a lot of nuance to this, uh, this uh, the use of the biologics. It's not just a or oh, patient says they're you know, atopic, so they'll respond to amalizumab. There's a lot more that goes into it. And that's why I wanted you guys to get familiar at least with all those different things, especially nitric oxide, periostin. Those are the things that I feel like in the future are gonna be the basis of you endotyping the asthmatics and then knowing that this person has a very high likelihood of responding to this biologic versus not. And maybe you will identify why they are not responding. Um, so, from a practical standpoint, if you have a patient in the clinic, they have a high IgE level, they're, uh, they're a topic, they have allergic asthma, uh, who, are, uh, who, uh, who are the patients that are approved from malizumab use? Those are the patients who have ages six and older. This is the only biologic that is for six uh, uh, years and older. Uh, the others are for 12 and above. Uh, if they have moderate to severe persistent asthma and then symptoms that are inadequately controlled by the inhaled corticosteroid, they have to have a positive allergy testing. So in our patient, they were allergic to um, house dust mites. And then for patients 6 to 12, or 11, 30 to 1,300 is the Ig level you're looking for. And then above 12, it's 30 to 700. Those are the two, uh, th those are basically the hard endpoints that you want to use when you're identifying a patient for a map in the clinic. So let's say you did identify someone and you want to give them that biologic, um, how do you give it? You give it every two to four weeks. And there's a dosing uh, and a frequency that's associated with body weight and the serum Ig levels on it on uh, the first encounter. Uh, it's basically just a graph that they've developed and they'll go down the columns of weight uh, and they'll decide based on uh, the Ig levels and the weight uh, what dose they want to give. Um, you don't have to monitor Ig levels when you're giving omalizumab. It is, there's no linear association with Ig levels coming down and their response being better. And then if you have to give them at least a trial of three to six months before you say, does it, did it work or did it not work? And then if there is a positive response, you want to continue that therapy 
throughout. This is a graph from the export study. This is a Zolaire persistency of response after long-term therapy study. And you can see that out uh, one year, 52 weeks, there's still a positive response for patients who were continued on omalizumab in terms of how many patients had asthma exacerbation. Um, the downsides, obviously, you want to know about is there's a very small risk of anaphylaxis, 0.1 to 0.2 percent. But despite that, FDA put a black box warning on omalizumab. So whenever you administer it, it has to be in a healthcare setting. You have to be ready with, um, you know, uh, dealing with anaphylaxis and you observe them for two hours after the injections and then 30 minutes after with subsequent injection. So just so you know, it's, um, it is somewhat of a, a resource intensive thing to do this, to administer this, but um, generally speaking, it's relatively safe. Case two, um, somewhat similar, but now it's an elderly gentleman, also severe and controlled asthma. He's also telling you whenever he, he's on so much prednisone that he's starting to get weight gain. He says, maybe in the past, someone gave me omalizumab. I didn't really respond well to it. And then you got a CBC and it shows an uh, absolute xenophil count of 200 cells. So what are you going to use now? So hey, ma'am, very good, very good. <laughs> so hey, we'll fix all your problems. Yeah, that's great. So here the answer is uh, mepolizumab, uh, and I'll explain why. So mepolizumab is uh, basically an antibody, and I guess this is useful for you guys in the back for your boards. If they ask you how it works, it inhibits IL-5 um, by preventing IL-5 from binding to its receptor on eosinophils and reducing downstream uh, eosinophilic inflammation. Kind of just harping on the same thing in the, uh, that I've done in the past slides. The main thing that this prevents is um, it uh, dampens the effect on eosinophilic uh, proge uh, progenitors in the bone marrow and prevents their release into the bloodstream and then their maturation as well. So this was a trial that they did with mepolizumab. They basically randomized them to intravenous mepolizumab and, they, and subcutaneous mepolizumab and placebo. And they looked at their effects. And you can obviously see that there is a positive effect in the number of patients who had asthma exacerbations was way lower in the mepolizumab group, significantly lower in the mepolizumab group, both intravenous and subcutaneous versus placebo. And then uh, when you looked at their FEV1, there was a, 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 a greater improvement in FEV1 post uh, uh, use of subcutaneous or IV mepolizumab versus placebo. Um, another question was that they didn't assess in uh, the omalizumab trial was, uh, okay, if I'm on a bunch of steroids and this patient is having symptoms from steroids, can I start to cut down on those steroids and still maintain a positive benefit? And the answer is actually, yes, you can continue to reduce the dose. You can see here in the patients who got mepolizumab, their median change percent of uh, corticosteroids was way lower. They were able to wean off 60% uh, versus placebo. Uh, and uh, despite weaning that, they still had lower cumulative asthma exacerbations and they still had better um, uh, asthma control questionnaires, ACQ scores compared to the placebo. Um, so you can start to wean those glucocorticoids and not lose the therapeutic benefit uh, or control of your asthma. The reason why I put in that question, the caveat of, oh, this gentleman, maybe someone gave him omalizumab in the past and it didn't work, was they actually also looked at that. If someone had prior omalizumab use versus not ever used it in the past, you still preserve the effect of mepolizumab in patients who've trialed omalizumab and failed, perhaps, you still had the benefit of mepolizumab in those groups. So if you have a patient in your clinic, you want to give them mepolizumab, who is it approved for? Patients 12 years and older, remember this is, um, the omalizumab is the only one that's approved for uh, six to 11 years. This is 12 years and older. You have to have severe asthma and it has to be of an eosinophilic phenotype. So that's why it was useful to listening to all of those slides I mentioned in the past too. So you can identify eosinophilic phenotype. Um, so you have, um, uh, remember here that the FDA actually doesn't recommend a specific cutoff, but all of those control trials I just showed you, they actually used uh, 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 an AEC count or a xenophil count of at least 150 and above. So um, that's kind of where you would uh, have your ballpark number when you're getting a CD, uh, not a CD, a self count with diff. <laughs> when you're getting your CD. Uh, how do you administer it? Uh, mepol <laughs> mepolizumab is uh, given every four weeks, 100 milligram dose. Uh, and you usually see a response in four months. So it's somewhat similar between the other biologics. Um, usually you, you have to give them that time frame. Uh, and again, same with omalizumab, you have to continue the, the therapy if you see a positive clinical response. Um, Reslizumab, very quickly, is very similar to mepolizumab, exactly the same mode of action. They studied it specifically, however, in a very specific group, which was the xenophil counts more than 400. And just to kind of give you a quick example, uh, obviously there was reduced uh, uh, asthma exacerbations in, those, uh, in that group versus placebo of 54%, and they had a better FEV1 of 0.1 liters uh, as compared to placebo. Uh, 
who is this approved for? This is actually 18 years and older and a very severe xenophilic asthma group uh, when you have an xenophil count above 400. Um, this is given weight-based. I don't really like this that much. I feel like it's a very narrow spectrum where this is used. Um, and it's also uh, dosing, it seems a bit more complicated than the previous ones we talked about. Uh, also has a black box warning like melizumab due to three anaphylaxis cases that they had noted in uh, the control trials, uh, but otherwise no other adverse events. Um, then we come to um, venralizumab. Uh, this is a, uh, now we've done the, um, uh, we're talking about the IL-5 receptors on xenophils. This, the way this differs from mepolizumab is that this actually binds to the IL-5 receptor on xenophils. Uh, and then it does, has the same downstream effects. It prevents the recruitment and activation of xenophils. And in addition, it actually also activates natural killer cells to cause apoptosis of the xenophils. Um, how, who did they study this in? The same group. Uh, xenophil count above 150. They were patients who had severe persistent, uh, severe uncontrolled asthma, uh, and they were randomized. Uh, the important part I wanted to focus on here is that they actually randomized them to two groups. One was giving benralizumab every four weeks, and one was giving it every eight weeks. Um, and what was interesting in that study is actually there's no difference when you give it between every four weeks to eight weeks compared to placebo. They both had uh, benefit in the number of uh, reducing the number of asthma exacerbations. Uh, they also studied, just like mepolizumab, whether you were able to wean off the glucocorticoid dosing, and that actually, they, they were successfully able to do that. There was a mean median change of 75% in those patients in both arms, the eight-week and four-week group, compared to placebo, where they were able to come off their glucocorticoid dosing. Um, uh, and who is this approved for? Age 12 and over, you have to have an xenophil count more than 300. And then actually, because they saw that benefit in eight, the eight-week arm versus the four-week arm was uh, about similar, they administer benralizumab um, uh, every four weeks for the first three doses, and then it's every eight weeks. So if you have a patient, difficult to combine the clinic, they're coming every you know, two or three months, uh, you want to use something that you can administer at long intervals, this is the one you want to go for. Um, so um, apart from that, it's usually well-tolerated, just like the others, it can have a risk of anaphylaxis and urticaria and anticaria. Um, the, I think this is the last question it would be 40 year old male against severe uncontrolled asthma. He also, however, though, tells you he's having some nasal polyps as well. And you're like the pulmonologist of the future. You check a fractional exhaled nitric oxide level and it comes back at more than 25, but his IG is not impressive. His, his xenophil count is more than 150. Okay. Maybe it's impressive. Maybe not so great, but the, the, pheno, the pheno catches your attention and the nasal polyps. So what are you going to use for this gentleman? And dupilumab, very good. Yeah, exactly. That's the one. So you use <laughs> you use dupilumab, and um, uh, this uh, just a brief summary on what this is. It binds to your IL-4 receptor, uh, and it prevents downstream effects of both IL-4 and IL-13. And uh, uh, what's the most important thing about that is that it, uh, apart from um, preventing production of IgE and recruitment of inflammatory cells, it also has an effect on uh, preventing goblet cell hyperplasia, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, who did they study this in? They same age of 12 and over, severe and controlled asthma. Uh, and they had actually for recruitment, didn't have a minimum uh, xenophil count or IgE level. And just similar to the uh, other biologics, great benefit uh, compared to placebo uh, in reduction of oral glucocorticoids. Uh, but more interesting in this study that I wanted to point out was this um, uh, uh, chart here first. Um, so here, what you see is that, remember we mentioned that fractional exhaled nitric oxide. So when they actually did a subgroup analysis of the patients with dupilumab therapy, you see that the more they skew towards that xenophil uh, phenotype, so the higher xenophil count in their serum, and the higher they had the fractional excretion of uh, exhalation of nitric oxide, the more they were likely to respond to dupilumab. And this just keeps adding to the, 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 the underlying theme of this presentation, which is to have you understand that there's uh, a lot of heterogeneity in asthma, and there's certain biomarkers that we will slowly focus on in the future who will help us tailor therapy better and try to identify patients better who will respond to different biologics uh, or existing therapy for asthma as well. Um, why did I mention the nasal polyps? The nasal polyps is important because they actually did a trial in patients who had uh, some, uh, chronic rhinosinusitis and nasal polyposis, and they actually did randomize them to placebo and dupilumab, and there was a, a great response in response uh, with the use of dupilumab. Uh, they have their own scales in terms of uh, uh, nasal polyp severity and posterior rhinorrhea, and obviously those were much improved in patients who received dupilumab. So if you have a patient who comes in, they're giving you the symptom of polyposis, severe asthma that's uncontrolled, uh, 
uh, and you think they're uh, more of a xenophilic uh, phenotype, uh, this is the one you want to go towards. So who is it approved for? You have to have age more than 12. You have to have that severe xenophilic asthma. You have to have an uh, xenophilic count of more than 150. And then this is given every two weeks. Um, just to summarize uh, all of those different, you know, uh, the biologic therapies, the thing I wanted to mention was uh, the special considerations column. So omalizumab, you're thinking about that when you have a younger patient, allergic asthma, six to 11 years old. Mepolizumab is when you're starting to think about patients who have xenophilic asthma, uh, you wanna wean their corticosteroids, um, and it's also been studied in uh, uh, EGPA. So that's another subgroup that you can think about. Uh, Benralizumab is one that I really like to harp on because it has that ease of administration every eight weeks versus you know two weeks or four weeks. Uh, so patients that are find it difficult to come to the clinic, maybe that is the one that you want to go towards. And dupilumab, I mentioned again, patients who have uh, that type two high asthma, have nasal polyposis, that's the one you want to think about. And remember that if anybody asks you, doctor, can I start to reduce the dose of my steroids? I'm having symptoms from them. Almost all of them, just except omalizumab, have actually shown that you can remove or uh, you can reduce the dose of oral corticosteroids uh, successfully while maintaining control of your asthma. Okay. Uh, just one slide on T2 low. It's basically the summary of it is not well understood. It's thought, thought to be from neutrophilic inflammation. There's other things that uh, factor into it, including obesity, where there's abnormal chest wall biomechanics, and then smoking uh, seems to have some kind of uh, contributory effect. And then um, uh, this is the that phenotype which I mentioned, which is your cluster three, cluster five phenotype, the fixed airflow obstruction, the patients who are obese, high BMI, uh, or late onset of age and not responding to steroid therapy. That's your T2 low, T2 low asthma. And to be honest, there's not a lot of different things that have been studied for the therapy of that. There are things coming down the line where they have TH, uh, they have, um, uh, they're focusing on the therapies for TH17 cells and biologics for those, but really nothing for now has been studied. Um, and uh, one of the things I just wanted to plug in is the AIR2 trial. Um, you know, this is also a study that um, is a, a kind of a different uh, approach to severe uncontrolled asthma. These were, again, patients who had uh, moderate to severe asthma. And um, uh, uh, when they did these bronchothermoplasties in these patients, 79% of them versus 64% had better asthma quality of life scores. They had reduction in severe exacerbations. They had less emergency room visits and they had less time lost from work, school, and other daily activities. So um, the reason I put this in here is that let's say everything else is failing, biologic therapies, steroids, everything that's established, maybe this is something that we can start to also move towards in terms of intervention for our severe asthmatics. Um, in conclusion, it's very clear that asthma is a heterogeneous disease now. It's not just this one umbrella term that we use. Uh, our current understanding is still very limited of those phenotypes, and there's a lot of limitations associated with those phenotypes, even if you can neatly put your patients in them. Uh, and we obviously need more investigations to start to develop better biomarkers, more accurate biomarkers, easily attainable pragmatic biomarkers to help us put them in those needle boxes where we know how they'll respond to our therapy. Any questions? I know, guys. <laughs> I know. When I was making this, believe me, I was like, whoa, who, who put, who gave me this topic? But this is, um, the, the, but uh, this is as simple as I could make it. Honestly, it was way worse than this, but it was as simple as I, as I could make it. And I hope you did at least understand the, the crux of the matter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. All righty.
Thank you, guys.